Today's market call is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. And FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Yo, Peep Swizz here, Dan there. One o'clock on the East Coast, the 18th of March. Hope everybody enjoyed their St. Patrick's Day. Yesterday, Rangers beat the Islanders at MSG. Great news. The bad news, of course, Ryan Lindgren was hurt, as Dan will tell you. Amanda is nodding her head. Uh, how are you, Dan? I'm doing okay. It's my anniversary today, guys. Oh! 24 years. Sarah's not watching right now, but, uh, you know, just, just saying that. I'm all excited about that. So, big day today. Your Rangers are just on a absolute tear. What are they, like five of the last six or something like that? Well, I mean, they, they played six games in eight days. I mean, in hockey, that's, that's a yeah. lot of hockey. Yeah. And they played some stout teams along the way. And, you know, they emerged victorious in five of those games. So, good for the Rangers uh, as they – are now competing for uh, the President's Cup. Obviously, I know that means nothing. That's yeah. obviously the best record in the league regular season. The Bruins won last year, as I mentioned, only to be summarily dispatched or dismissed, or whatever you want to say, by the Florida Panthers in seven games. But we're not here to talk about that, not. Dan. But a happy anniversary Thanks. to you and Sarah. 24 years. Next year's a big one, so don't screw it up. I will not. Uh, I promise you that. Um, this is a big day. And I know we said that a couple days we last all the week. Time. We said no, it no. all the time. But, but I agree with you, by the way. But, 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 okay. You know, think about this. Every time you open up and fail, every time the leadership is driving the train and then just doesn't act you know, the way in which you would hope it to, given the news flow, given the excitement around it, given the narrowness of the rally within tech, in my opinion, because that's another story. We've talked about the narrowness of the broad market rally and in, 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 at different times over the last year. A lot of folks have said they're excited that it's broadening out to other sectors and the like. You teased something this morning on our Insta that I thought was a really interesting thing, it wasn't on my radar, but you were talking about the failure at prior highs in the transports. We'll take a look at that. I was focused on my preview of Market Call on let's just see how far this super micro can go the day that it's added to the S&P 500. I think it gapped up like 5%. It was trading near an all-time high, you know, after a, what, 280-point uh, or 80 percent rally guy in a little more than two months so those are the two things that you and i are focused on mm -hmm. let's see how they're playing out because i actually think we put our finger on two very important components to this broadening out of the rally here guys and that leads us to our rundown i mean all eyes are on nvidia in this conference i think yeah. i think he starts he jensen wang starts speaking at four to six i believe that's when the 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 i guess his remarks are slated for this evening so stick around for that what we're watching absolutely super micro and the transports you know i've been watching the transports for a while for exact that for that reason to see if it got through that prior high apparently we have not for you doubt theorists out there and apparently there's some people out there that think bitcoin is going to party on to 150,000. so you know that's just why not throw that in there because as a cme day and they trade, obviously, Bitcoin futures. So they have at it, as you say, Dan. Well, listen, I, you know, we talk about Bitcoin when sentiment's really bad. We talk about it when it's really good. The truth is, when it's just kind of lukewarm, there's probably not so much to talk about. But I think the correlation to the sort of risk assets that we focus on in the stock market and the futures market, express the options and stuff like that. I think there's a high correlation, right? If, if you think about this AI trade, um, if you think about the way people think about some of the players in crypto and some of the big coins and, and you know, whatever, like, you know, it, it's not too different. A lot of the investors in these things are kind of the same folks, you know what I mean? Looking to same, achieve the same sorts of outsized returns. So to me, I always find it fascinating. And I think the the fact that we're at like a, you know, a one point three or four trillion dollar market cap for Bitcoin mm -hmm. without all the laser eyes, without all this other goofiness. Now, granted, I did get an email from Coinbase today showing me all the coins that have had the biggest gains over the last month or so, guy or, or month to date or something. And it's all the crap that you expect. Right. It's not. Bitcoin. It's not ETH. It's not the things that real institutions are getting behind. And I think that's the thing that you and I totally respect that. Do you know what I mean? This morning, Crypto.com CEO and founder was on Squawk and Friends on CNBC 
very sober guy. I mean, he, he is not the sort of guy you don't you don't get a sense. He's just trying to get a, the retail into you know, a hype frenzy or anything like that. You saw that clip, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I saw you share it. So I thought that's really interesting. I think this rally in Bitcoin is built on something different, and we can we can focus on that a little bit later too. All, all fair, and you know, let's just take. A, and I agree with you, by the way. Let's take a look at the futures, or at least through the lens of the three things that we watch. I mean, yeah. we look at obviously. The Nasdaq, the E mini futures in 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 the Nasdaq, the S and P five hundred futures, and obviously the Russell futures, and you can see year to date. I mean, both of those are basically you know between seven and eight and a half percent. The one that I look at, and it will continue to look at, though, comes in the form of this of the Russell two thousand, because just when it seems like it's breaking out to the upside, Dan, it stalls out again. So that's the trend line we've talked about. It. We're going to look at the other trend lines. They all look very similar. You know, but the fact that we seemingly can't get out of our own way, and if we were to go real time and look out, you know, a couple of years, you'll see that despite the fact that we traded through, you know, that resistance level, we came right back down through it. So maybe a bit of a false breakout. That trend line is in place. We're testing the uptrend here right now. And again, the most economically sensitive names as rates continue to sort of grind higher. And there you go, longer term. You know, I'm I'm somewhat troubled by this. Maybe I shouldn't be. Maybe it's just a matter of time before. We're making new all-time highs here, but it's something to watch for sure. Yeah, and the Russell's interesting because, again, if you're buying into this broadening out theme, you know, you want to see small caps start to participate. We've seen all sorts of sectors do really well over the last kind of month, month and a half or so from financials, energies kind of picking up its head. That's a, a, an area that you've been focused on. Obviously, industrials and retail and transports. There's lots of things that are going to back at their all-time highs or at least making multi-year highs. And, you know, to this, to your point about small caps, they really can't get out of their own way right here. You know, you see that kind of move from a 52 week low to a 52 week high, but we're kind of stuck in that multi year range. So to me, I think that's one that you definitely want to see confirm. Um, you know, I, I'm a bit more focused on the NASDAQ and maybe these guys could pull up a tweet that I did last Friday afternoon. And I tweeted out a chart of the QQQ on top of guy. Well, there, there's the NASDAQ futures the nasdaq 100 futures we're going to focus on that we're going to trade that in a second here but it was kind of interesting because you know we had this kind of break of that uptrend guy and we we detailed a qqq uh put trade here and you know i want to kind of think about the nasdaq futures here and i want to think of it in the context of what is driving the train today okay so we had this headline out of bloomberg this morning that Google is in talks with Apple, okay, to license their Gemini. This is their generative AI large language model to Apple. Now, Apple, if they want to pull up that chart really quickly, Apple is down 14.5% or so at its lows just last week from its 52-week and all-time highs. One of the main stories there, we get it, is that they do not have a generative AI product, okay? And that's they're just missing this entire hype. But on the flip side of that, guy, we also know that while you know, Google Alphabet has declared themselves an AI first company, and they did that years ago. Their launches, first of Bard, then of Gemini, have not gone particularly well. That stock, there it is right there, you know, until today's announcement was really kind of lagging here. So, you know, the idea that those two laggards are kind of joining the generative AI party, it's great. But on the flip side of that, right, we know that Microsoft's already enjoyed all these gains. We know that this, uh, NVIDIA and the like have really dominated the excitement. So, like, to me, the NASDAQ setting up, and we'll talk about this GTC, this event, NVIDIA today and tomorrow, but it's really setting up for what I think is a proper retest of that uptrend. And I last thing I'm going to say here, and I'm going to let you speak, is that Liz Young, EY from SoFi, mm -hmm. we're talking with mm -hmm. her on the, on the tape podcast this morning, she gave us a stat that was in her investing blog that said the S&P 500 has not had a down 2% day since February of 2023, which would be the longest run since 2018. So you get everything I'm saying here. I think we're kind of getting towards the death rattle of this party here that we've been on for the last few months. Lovely yeah. visual there. So you see, this is obviously the NASDAQ e-mini future. So go back to that Google chart real quick, if you may. And you'll see that little bit of an island we created when we opened higher today. Uh, the stock has already traded close to 50 million shares. It typically trades 30 million shares a day. So we're probably on course to trade maybe two and a half, maybe three times normal volume by the end of the day. We'll see. So just keep an eye on that. Remember this visual. And now go to a longer term chart. And you'll see 
we've outlined sort of the double tops in Google a couple times. So if we are unable to today to take out those prior highs, I, I, I happen to think it's somewhat problematic. Now, with that said, you know, you have the moving averages working your way, the trade down, traded down to and held and bounced off of. I get all those things. But if we fail today, Dan, on a big volume day, this is one of those days in terms of Google specifically, you want to bookmark for sure. 100%. All right, let's go back to the NASDAQ 100 futures here. And again, this is how I want to trade this thing. It's 18,000, let's call it 250, all right? A nice round number. Guy, you see that high from about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks or so. It's right below 18,500 mm -hmm. or so. If I want to short the E-mini NASDAQ 100 futures right here, playing for a reversal like you talked about in some of those big components, we've already seen NVIDIA that was up 5% this morning go down on the day. If we were to see Apple and Google give up some of the gains that they have, okay, let's just say this was just a short squeeze or as a kind of trade into the, the, the Jensen Wang speech or whatever the heck it is, a combination of some other news, then this is a good spot right here, right now. Keep a tight stop. It's 18,500. I'm selling it at 18,250 here. I'm playing for a break of this uptrend. And then if it starts to go my way, I will continue to lower the stop and play for a move. Listen, you can draw that horizontal line from the breakout level. I get it, man. If you know, like the likelihood that we get back towards, you know, that's a nice round number of 16,000. That would be something that would have to play out like we saw from the July highs last year to the October lows. But at this point, I want to continue to take a little cracks at this thing and play for a break of that uptrend. And then if we have some fundamental news start to go away, like we saw with Adobe last week with some of these stories not playing out the way a lot of investors had hoped to, that's how you get this to kind of steamroll a little bit um, and, and catch some steam to the downside. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss that trade because I think you're right, by the way, again, to look at it through this lens. NVIDIA, which we mentioned, might as well throw a chart up or daily chart, whatever you wanna throw up. I mean, it traded up to 924 today. So it's basically from peak to trough down about $50. Or I'll do the math, a little over 5.5%. 5.5% represents roughly, you know, a little over $100 billion of market cap. And again, this is in the wake of that Friday move a couple of weeks ago that we saw where it took, you know, lopped off from peak to trough, you know, almost a quarter of a trillion dollars yeah. of market cap. I mean, it's just not, these are not normal. Th look. I don't think this is normal. Now, people say that's the new normal. This is the environment that we find ourselves in. But when a company of that size loses that kind of market cap, again, two Fridays ago and today, like this, I mean, that is at least you have to take note of it. You could say, you know what, guy, don't care. This thing's on its way to $1,500. That's fine. But, you know, for technicians out there, they see now two moves like this over the course of a week or so. And you have to take notice, which leads back to your trade. And if this thing continues to deteriorate, you know, that trade in terms of the the e minute futures in the NASDAQ, I think sets up really well for you. Yeah, well, when we were talking about this on the on the tape podcast that dropped on Friday with our co-host Danny Moses, we were talking about just kind of Microsoft, the enthusiasm in and around that name and what they've been able to do and their integration of open AI into other products. Last week it was security, you know, like you know, the weeks before it was other sort of productivity suite products and the like here. We get it. Okay. Like that's why the stock has been acting the way it is. That's why it trades at 35 times current and about 31 times next year's, which is obviously very rich for this company. We were making the case that Google, where investors had kind of just continued to be voting against this name and their execution on, you know, on the product side and the like, we were kind of talking about the potential for a really good pairs trade between the two of them, right? And so one of them has to do with really poor sentiment, really poor um, execution, but also really good valuation, right? So for the 31 times next year that Microsoft was trading, Alphabet with similar expected growth, OK, lower margins was trading at like 10 turns lower, right, at about 21 or 20 or something like that at a market multiple. So to me, that makes sense, still makes sense. But let's see if we can hold these gains here, guy. Let's real pull up the SMH components. We have that slide. And basically half of the SMH is comprised of four different stocks. And I'm I'm rounding up a wee bit, but not really. I mean, NVIDIA is 28 percent, Taiwan semi nine and a half. AMD and Broadcom, a little over 11%. For those two, you do the math, you get close to 50%. So just keep that in mind real quick. There's your SMH chart. Let's yep. look at a longer term SMH chart because it's, you know, look, I could see that trend line to the upside the same way we draw the line for the E-mini futures in the NASDAQ. But 
If you go longer term SMH, you know, the double tops that we blew through that were in place into December that we subsequently blew through, that past resistance becomes support. And you're going to be like, there's no friggin' way the SMH is going to trade back to 163. Well, I think it does. So if you believe, that, like I do, the SMH makes that move, that trade that Dan outlined before, I think, works really well. It's funny. You know, the other thing is, and we were talking about it in our on the tape chat, our market call chat with uh, some of our friends, contributors, co-hosts, producers and the like. We were just kind of putting in there was a bunch of headlines last week about kind of upstart GPU chip manufacturers and the like here who are coming, obviously, for this market share and the margin that NVIDIA has. And it's not just like upstart startups. It's also a lot of their customers. We've been talking about this for a long time. Microsoft, Amazon, you know, who, who run these these big public clouds, you know, they're trying to develop their own chips, right, to get the costs under control because there's this huge supply demand, you know, kind of imbalance and, and the like here. So, again, I, I like as good as the story feels right now, and I think it's likely to kind of if the news is going to be great today, OK, like it's going to be great. OK, and it's going to be great for the ecosystem. It's going to be great for the TAMs. It's going to be great for everything. If the stocks can't rally after that, that's the thing I think you're getting at. Guy might be saying something. And if you are to get any negative sort of news, you know, if there's some sort of performance issue, there's some sort of delay in productivity or, you know, production or something like that. You know, that's how these stories come undone. But again, we're early. And you know what? As your your football coach used to say early is what, Guy? If you're early, Dan, you're on time. This is actually good for you folks listening. We've yeah. mentioned it before, but any new viewers. So early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, the door is going to be locked. So don't even effing bother. Don't even bother. Don't even bother. Hey, really quickly, let's hit this SMCI chart. This was the comment that we had. Hey, listen. I love this thing. You want to get, is... If you want to get your day started properly on the Instagram, follow us at guy.adami. Why wouldn't you? Dan S. Nathan. And we have risk reversal media that's on the Insta. And we have a little bit of a preview every morning of what we're going to be doing here. This one was really interesting. So guy, this was when the stock was still up. It's, I, and when we posted this, this is a live chart right now, but when we posted it on Instagram, maybe they can find that the stock was raging. It was up like, I don't know, it was up five, six, 7% or something like that. So it did have that reversal. And you know, the other point I just wanted to make here is like, oh man, you know, they announced this thing going into the S and P 500. It turns into a rocket ship right after the announcement it goes in today. So it was announced a few weeks ago. So these S and P indexers now have to buy it basically at all time highs. You know what I mean? Like, how's that working out for them? I mean, like, like literally, it's just like what an ass nine way to do things, I guess. Well, uh, it's it's somewhat antiquated and outdated. I get it. But that's the way it's still done. But again, forgetting about that for a second, just the moves. You know, we just talked about the move in NVIDIA. Doug is sending us an email about some of the other reversals. But this is one of them as well, because this has become everybody's darling in terms of trading. And you know, again, when you see moves, intraday moves like this, now this is what, a $60 billion company? I mean, this is yeah. these are significant moves. You know, we mentioned Adobe last week. I think at its high last week, Adobe was the 40th largest company in the world. And you saw that lop off 14% over the course of a day. And again, you know, this reminds me of the David Einhorn comments a month and a half or so ago about the market being broken. I think that's a term that he used. And, you know, the market's clearly changed, but when you have stocks of that size move, you know the the magnitude of the moves over the course of hours, up or down. To me, that does not reek of a healthy market environment, Dan. No, it doesn't. And 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 again, you know, it's like we can put together lots of different risk assets that are trading in a certain way, and then you say to yourself, in a year, in a year, the S and P has not closed down two percent. I mean, just what what does that tell you? And and then it also says that, and we're going to get to yields in a second here. But it also says, like in this environment where you know this this latest leg of this rally, right, that started in mid December. Um, and has been unabated, you know what I mean, for three months or so right now. I mean, it was predicated for the most part on the fact that that yields were going to get cut six times this year by the Federal Reserve. So we obviously have the Fed meeting this week. This is one thing. And I was so glad that you posted this. So this was on the transports, the Dow transports. OK, let's start with your 
um, Instagram post, okay? And the comment that you had right here. And, you know, so that's a multi-year chart. You see the resistance there, unable to get through. Now, if these guys can pull up a one-year chart, because I think the one-year chart is also really interesting, guy, because, you know, we had that breakout in early February, um, and they can draw the horizontal there, line there. Mm -hmm. You see where that resistance was. But, you know, if this thing gets back through its 50 day moving average, which is basically, you know, um, 67, 60 or something. So not far um, away here. Mm -hmm. um, and then you look at that 200 day moving average. It's all the way down there. I think at like 62 and a half or something like that. You know, and you look at that breakout level. I mean, we're get, getting really quickly to a very crucial spot. Yeah, and say what you listen again. I understand Dow theory was a thing, you know, many decades ago, and we're in a different economy now. It's obviously a technology based economy, it's not the nuts and bolts and rust belt that the Dow theorists looked at. But I think people still look at that. And so, if we can do a longer term chart and you see the moving averages there, we're theoretically at support. But in terms of those double tops, I mean, that's in place. And if you want to know the components here, I think 45% of this is made up of three different stocks. I think it's Uber. Uh, UPS and UNP. I think in that order, I know Uber's number one. So it's basically the three U's. And you know the move we've seen in Uber recently, that's been parabolic. Uh, and the railroads have done well. But if you start to see weakness in some of these, obviously, high-flying names, which I do think you're going to see, and I mentioned Uber as a high flyer, you throw up a chart, you see exactly what I'm looking at. You know, then all of a sudden, this double tops in place. And I think people will start to focus. And again, Dan, you see that chart. I mean, this has gone from yeah. 40 to 80 in the blink of an eye. That's Uber, by the way. Yeah, look at that thing. Um, well, I think it's it's good to point out. I think the one-year chart is interesting. I think their longer-term chart with the double top is, is definitely sort of interesting, too. Um, I want to pull up one of the names. I think it's the fifth largest holding here, Guy, um, and it's FedEx. And FedEx, yeah. if you just look at this, the ramp that it had in the earnings, and I think I remember us previewing it a little bit um, on that. We didn't think the risk-reward set up pretty good um, at that point. Um, and it just goes to show you, you know, when you get on autopilot and the way you want to kind of buy a name that you might be like – you know, you think it's going to benefit from a broadening out theory, from a valuation, from a relative performance to one of its key peers to, you know, whatever the heck it is. Right. Look at that thing. I mean, this is not like a, this is not a gig economy stock or like an AI stock or this, that, whatever. This is FedEx. Right. And the news today, I did think it was kind of interesting, though, guy. FedEx and Amazon discuss partnership as competition for returning packages intensify. So Amazon, you know, they had this like same day delivery and people were just ordering multiple things that, you know, like of the same size and then just shipping them back. And it was becoming really expensive. And, you know, they have prime and prime works really well. I think the average prime subscriber spends like two or three X that of a regular Amazon, you know, consumer like here. But you know, when you see a headline like that after a company obviously disappointed relative to expectations, what, what's your two cents there? And, and, and maybe you have a take on FedEx as a, as a stock here. Well, you know, a lot of FedEx problems over the last few years have been FedEx specific, right? But obviously there's some macroeconomic things going on as well. But if you look at this chart and go back to the last one, because I think, you know, this one will clarify for you. You have the 50 day moving average crossing. Now, obviously, I think most people understand this, but by definition, the 50-day is going to move more violently or more exaggerated than the 200-day. The longer the duration, the slower it moves. So the 50 crossed through the 200-day moving average. And now it's a stock market thing, right? So if you see FedEx close below sort of this 245-ish level, you got to really wake up and say, wait a second, what's going on here? And then that will obviously make its way into the transports, which theoretically should make its way into the broader market. So again, when things look good to the upside, everybody's quick to point them out. And we try to as well in different things. But when things are setting up like this, technically, it's incumbent, of us to, incumbent upon us to point it out as well. So, again, a lot of FedEx problems are FedEx specific, but don't think for a minute that the macroeconomic backdrop impacts them as well. Yeah. And that was kind of the point I was making is that, you know, Amazon and uh, UPS, obviously competitor to FedEx, they have a deal on returns. And so when you start seeing FedEx after the quarter and guidance that they give, starting to talk to, you know, someone like Amazon, who's basically pulled back, right, from some of the, um, you know, the shipping that they've kind of, you know, obviously was a huge benefit to them. They pulled forward a lot of behavior during the pandemic. They were this kind of, you know, um, you know, like people became to rely on them and the pace in which they could get goods and not have to do things in person. It's just kind of interesting. It seems like a lot of things um, are kind of in flux here. Um, 
What do you want to do next year, guy? What's what's the one thing that's sticking out to you? Well, you know, this is a futures day, so a couple things. You know, yeah. if we can pull up a crude oil chart, because Ooh. again, you know, we've looked at this. Crude oil continues to sort of do the slow grind higher. The underlying stocks continue to do pretty well. These refiners have been off to the races. That's on the back. And I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but you know, crack spreads, three, two, one crack spreads for you energy people out there are really favorable, favorable for a lot of these refiners, specifically Valero. And you can see this. This is the chart that we've drawn for a while. I mean, this channel is still in place now. We're smack dab in the middle of it now. But the fact, Dan, I think that we've traded through the 200 day and are holding above it, I think is encouraging. So, you know, being a futures day, I still think you play crude from the long side here. And you know, we can talk about copper real quick, but that's sort of my two cents here in crude. Yeah, well, crude, I mean, you know, the, the funny thing about crude, and you and I have kind of kind of gone back and forth on this, and you've been buying the dips in it. We've been detailing it, a way to kind of keep raising your stops. You know, you got back to this $80 level. It seems like we're kind of consolidating, uh, you know, in and around that above the moving average here. So you see that uptrend that's been in place. You know, maybe you get a move back towards the higher end of that would get you the mid to high um, 80s or so. And it'll be really interesting to me, Guy, to see what the macro news looks like at that point. Where is the dollar? Where is yield? Where is some of the economic data that we're tracking both here and abroad? What do the geopolitical situations look like, whether it be in Ukraine and Russia, Middle East and the like? So, again, I think your point has been with crude over the last few months or so, um, you know, while we're down considerably from the 52 week highs, despite the news flow, it continues to make basically a series of higher lows and higher highs. So that's still the theme here, I guess. I think it's encouraging. And again, I mean, it makes the Fed's job, I think, um, that much more difficult because I don't think enough people are paying attention to specifically gasoline. If we could pull up copper real quick, or if you want to pull up Freeport McMoran, FCX, we're right at this 45 level. And if you look at a longer term chart, you will see. I mean, this has been resistance. I think if we could go, yeah, that. So you could see sort of these tops. Every time we've gotten up to this level over the last, I don't know, year and a half, two years, we failed. Uh, we're here again. Uh, I think we're going to ratchet through it because if you look, if we pull up a copper chart real quick, you'll see copper looks like it's breaking out. So there you go. Thank you, Amanda or and or Jacob. I mean, this is, and if you do longer term, you'll see even a little bit better um, nobody's talking about this copper move, at least nobody that I've heard. Uh, but copper next to crude oil is probably the most important uh, commodity there is when you sort of look at things through the inflationary lens. And this thing is sort of ratcheting higher. And this is going to, you can see that downtrend. I mean, your eye can see it, Dan. Yep, A yep. long term downtrend from two, 2022 that we've seemingly broken through. Now, it's got some work to do. It's got to get to sort of four and a half or so. But, you know, I think copper's in play here too. Yeah. So you talked about just basically inflation. We spent some time last week talking about some of those readings, CPI and then PPI and just kind of the divergent sort of uh, equity price action to those two prints that we saw. I think it was Tuesday and Thursday with PPI, you know, basically doing a number, at least on just sentiment as it relates to equities a little bit here. You know, Doug uh, Cass over there at Real Money, he hits us here. You guys have been talking about the same thing, I think, for the last couple of weeks or so, the decoupling between what has been happening in the rates market. Right. And what's been happening in the equity market. Equities just don't seem to care right now for now. You know, and if you think about let's just pull up the 10 year yield for a second. You know, Carter and I were in the camp where we kind of see lower yields. This was kind of heading into that inflation readings. I was very wrong. I cut a position uh, on the TLT. I was kind of articulating it through the the, the view of uh, equities, long calls, call spreads that and the like here. And I had to cut that one because that was not working out. Well, there's the yield chart. It's obviously inverse to the TLT chart. Really important technical level there, guy. It bounced right where it should have, okay? And granted, that's not the most beautiful of uptrends, but it's fine. It's two points. We put them together here. Let's see how it acts at this level because you've been in the camp where you are not going to be surprised if this thing was back at 4.5%. And this week, we're going to get some excitement here with the Fed Chair Powell speaking Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. And, you know, we we dropped the podcast earlier today with Elizabeth. As you mentioned, you should check it out because we we actually went in a bit of a longer disc, not discourse, a longer sort of conversation about what we thought he would say and what he's been saying all along. But again, I've been in the higher rates camp. I was in the higher rates camp when they were going higher. And then obviously that move from five to three eighty caught me off guard without question. You know, I thought there was a chance for a pullback, but that pullback I thought would stop at four and a half. It obviously didn't. But here we are again, back on the horse. And 
And I think it's telling a story. I think the story it's telling is inflation is a problem. And obviously, Treasury needs to sort of basically put out a lot of paper that needs to be priced. And I think the markets can demand a higher yield for that. So it's a supply demand thing as well. And here we are. If you want to pull up a CME Fed rate uh, what tool watch, or I mean, yeah. that's going to speak to some of the things we've been talking about. Now, again, I don't think anybody thinks they're going to move this meeting. I agree with that. It's seemingly been pushed out now uh, to June or beyond, Dan. And I think that's probably right. I think it's I think it's later in the year than the market realizes, which, by the way, I think actually people should be rooting for, quite frankly. But, you know, that's that's another conversation for another time. Yeah, so it's interesting. So here's here's the June probabilities um, of a cut. OK, and this is, you know, basically it's 50 50 here. And, and I think what's interesting about this is that coming into this year, if you bought equities, it, let's pull up the S&P futures chart going back to December. And remember that breakout there? And it was after that kind of mid deck um, Fed meeting and the presser. And it just seemed, you know, pretty dovish here. Right. And so when you think about that, I think there were five or six cuts in 2024 that were priced in. Well, here we are. We're basically at the end of Q1 of 2024. And now the Fed fund futures future is basically saying it's a coin flip, which probably gets worse, right? If the data continues the way it has been, guy, right? As we get to June. So now we're looking at three cuts back half of the year that may or may not happen. I mean, who knows? Because I actually think the further we get in the year, the closer to the election, and again, I'm not meaning to assume that the Fed has any political tendencies one way or another, but they may actually basically not get involved if they have not cut over the course of the summer guy, right? In an effort to kind of remain very independent and not kind of change any sort of tune one way or another. And you can say, it, you know, a cut would be good for the current administration or it can be bad. I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows, but we know historically rate cuts have meant, okay, a bit of a, like a, a you know, a tailwind to the economy, a tailwind to risk assets. So I, I hear you. And if, you know, Doug is talking about the TLT, if we were to close lower today, it would be eight days in a row, which, you know, again, I can't, I don't know if that's happened before. I don't remember it. But, you know, if you want to pull up a TLT chart real quick, Amanda, you'll see the November low was basically 82 and a half or so. We rallied up to sort of 108 ish. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, actually, it did. It got to about 108 or so. So you do that math. I, I'm sorry. I apologize. The December high was 100. My, I apologize, Dan. Yep. But you do the math, a 50% retracement of that move is 90. And we're here at 92 and a half. So 90 should be support. And 90 in terms of yield is probably somewhere between 438 and 440. So put that on your radar screen, folks, as well. No, I mean, listen, that seems like a foregone conclusion at this point. Again, this is coming from somebody who thought that we'd see lower yields in the near term. I was really interested just to see how you know investors might perceive some of this data here heading into the Fed um, as, you know, again, like, you know, they've been a lot more hawkish than people thought they were in mid-December when they started buying equities with impunity. You know, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I guess that disconnect is something um that will remain fairly interesting. Um, you want to look at the dollar here really quickly, the Dixie. And, and, you know, one of the reasons why we had John Butters on, our friend who is the senior earnings insight analyst over at FactSet, I think it was on last Thursday's show. And we were talking about how expectations for Q4, how they came in relative to, um, you know, results. This would be earnings and guidance. And then how... Q1 has already come down. That's the trend where estimates come down over the course of the big, you know, the dollar here, you know, you got that flattening 200 day moving average if we're looking at the Dixie here, right? And you see this thing, you know, it's basically trading where it was a year ago. And you talk about it's at the midpoint of that range. So pretty soon, I think the dollar, unless we were to see a meaningful move lower or higher guy, it's kind of neutralized in the near term. Does that make sense? Makes and it really sense. Come Especially down to yeah, I mean, if you think about what we just outlined for the TLT. So if you have room to 90 in the TLT, so if maybe yields can get up to somewhere between 437 and 4.4%, I mean, the dollar theoretically should sort of top out around 104. I'm doing back of the envelope math, but basically it'll top out right around the moving average. So there'll be, a. by the way, and this is probably as we get into the year, there's going to be a point where I think yields could go up and the dollar goes down, but that's a much different conversation for another time. Right now, they're sort of moving in tandem. But what all this leads to is the thing that we teased earlier on, and that gives Bitcoin. If you pull yeah. that slide up now, everybody's getting all geeked up in Bitcoin on a day, by the way, 
again, we've seen some reversals in, in crypto as well. Bitcoin's down. The last I looked, I want to say, what, 67,000 and change. So yep. here we are with another one of those interesting Bitcoin days, Dan, with because at one point today, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was, I want to say close to 69,000 or so. But anyway, here we are. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, this one's kind of interesting. If they want to pull up a five-year log chart, because I think this is probably a decent way to look at it, Guy. Um, and, you know, obviously it's had this huge move. Um, you know, it's gone from, what, 30,000 to, you know, 70,000 um, in just from the, you know, the, the lows in the fall here. But if we want to look at it and kind of broaden it out a little bit, I think a lot of folks thought this thing might get stuck at those prior all-time highs. It was a double top from 69,000. And if you think about how far it's come, over the last kind of year and a half or so. I mean, this is probably from a technical perspective, a decent way to look at it. And so if you were to have a pullback, a consolidation, you know what I mean? And around that levels, I mean, that's probably a great reload level. If you think one of the biggest drivers, and we heard that from the CEO of crypto.com this morning was obviously institutions and a lot of retail who now feel a lot more comfortable, right? About getting access to Bitcoin, doing it basically with their broker dealer. And plenty of people are going to still use platforms like crypto.com, right? But there's been inflows to Bitcoin because now they can buy it in these spot ETFs. I think he feels, that's good for the ecosystem. You know what I mean? The more people who own it, like the better it is for the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a bunch of vol dampening, which I think the ETFs and some of the instruments that you can now, you can trade options on them. There's futures on them at the CME and the like. So this thing consolidating in that 60 to 70 range for a while might be a really good thing, guys. We've seen pullbacks before, obviously, and it feels as if we're on the precipice of another one, you know, I don't know what it means for risk assets and I'm not a, uh, you know, you've forgotten more about crypto than I'll know, but the euphoria out there and, you know, that last slide where people are talking about 150,000, I mean, we, yes, listen, that might happen. Listen, it could be Dow 80,000 one day in our lifetime, but, you know, it's the moves in the interim that matter. And I, I'm pretty convinced that the move in the interim for the broader market is lower. And I'm not all that confident that Bitcoin is going to continue this upward trajectory unabated. Unabated. Yeah. Real quickly, last chart, just pull up a one year of the Bitcoin. And, and again, you know, um, just a few weeks ago, this thing was making a little base guy um, after a big run. It went from 40 to 50,000. And then it had that little consolidation. You see that. And then went up from, you know, 50 to, you know, basically 70 in a straight line. So to your point, maybe 60 is the next stop. But even if it were to get back to 52, 53 or something like that and just some profit taking, that wouldn't be so unhealthy either. And that's kind of, you know, I know on a percentage basis that looks like a lot, but look at how much, you know, look how far this thing has come since the September lows when it was trading at 25,000 or so. So, all right, that's all I got for you, bud. We covered a lot of ground here today. We did cover a lot of ground. Nixon and Golden State tonight. Let's see if they can stop him. I mean, seriously, the guy's being, a freak, Steph, or Steph Curry. You I mean, he's just. Steph. You love him. I, you know, I do love him, and the Knicks were within one pick of draft. He, I think he wanted to be a Nick. I know the Knicks wanted him, and if they wanted him that badly, they should have traded up to get him. They didn't, and they probably regret it to this day, but we're going to see him tonight if you stay up late. But stay that's it. Late. Dan is coming to the NASDAQ, do a little fast money. I will be there as well. Check it out, uh, and check out the CME group because they do it the right way, Dan. Well, we're at risk meets opportunity guy and that's kind of right at the intersection of market call our friends from fact set who supply all those tricked out charts and all the data uh that we use in market call so thanks to them also um guy i'll see you a little bit later thanks so later, much later peeps bye <laughs>